In this video, we look at comparing complexity of various algorithms. So this video assumes you're already familiar with Big O notation. So if you've not yet seen it, we suggest you go back and watch our previous video, which covers that first. So this video also assumes that you have a reasonable amount of prior knowledge of the data structures shown here and the algorithms associated with them. We won't be looking at them again in detail. Instead, we're going to consider each one in the context of big O notation. To keep the illustration simple, we're only going to be using examples that look at a set of numbers. Now, in reality, this abstraction would most likely represent a larger set of records. For example, these numbers could relate to product codes, descriptions and their prices. For simplicity, we're only going to focus on the numbers. So let's start by considering a classic array in list. Adding an item simply means putting it at the end. Therefore, it doesn't matter how big the array or list is. Even as it grows, the operation remains the same. Adding items to a serial array or list therefore has a constant O1 time complexity. Consider a situation where we are scanning a barcode to look up a product description and price. If this data is stored in serial fashion in a normal array and there's no order to the data, the only thing we can do is search the items one by one starting from the beginning. Finding the item we need would only require a simple while loop. As the number of items in the array grows, so does the number of items we need to check before we find the one we're looking for, assuming a worst case scenario. Therefore, a linear search has a linear or ON time complexity. It's worth noting that if the item we're looking for was always at the beginning of the array, the time complexity would be O1 or constant, regardless of the size of the data set. But with big O notation, we have to assume a worst case scenario, that the item we're looking for is at the end of the array. This means that as the array grows, so does the number of checks we need to perform. Remember that the whole point of big O notation is to provide us with a mechanism for comparing the complexity or efficiency of one algorithm against another. Looking at the various searching methods you need to know about for the exam, you can see that if we only ever considered the best, best case scenario, they all have the same constant time complexity. It's not until we start to consider the algorithms based on their average and worst case scenarios that we can make more informed choices about which one to use for any given situation. Now, sometimes we don't actually need to search an array item by item if we already know which item we want. In this case, the time complexity would once again be O1 constant, as the size of the array again wouldn't really matter. So let's consider how this compares to a situation where we're maintaining a sequential order to the items. So here we see that the items in the array have been placed in order. We now want to insert product 007 as a new item. All the other items will need to shuffle down one space to make room. We'd most likely use a while or a for loop to carry out the insertion, which once again has a O N linear time complexity. As the number of items in the array grows, so does the number of shuffles we need to perform. However, having a sorted array gives us a significant advantage. We could now use a binary search to half the set of numbers with each selection. The time complexity then would be O log N logarithmic for finding the item. Say we're looking for item 008. We find the midpoint and check if it's the item we're looking for. If it's not, we discard half the list. We find a new midpoint from the remaining list and check again. We repeat the process until we find the item we want. 
So if we're not adding items frequently, but we are searching for them very frequently, we're better off using a sorted sequential array. It all comes down to analysing what your programme needs to do and making the most efficient choices. This way we can gain the advantages of the time complexity offered by a binary search at the cost of the time complexity of inserting a new piece of data. Next, let's consider stacks and queues. We effectively have two main operations to consider with each structure. With stacks, it's pushing and popping, and with queues, it's enqueuing and dequeuing. As the size of these stru structures doesn't affect their operation in any way, these operations once again have a constant O1 time complexity. If you want to check where, whether an item exists in a stack or queue, we need to search through it one element at a time because the contents are not stored in order. This therefore results in a linear or ON time complexity. So next we'll consider hash tables. So with hashing, we take the item we're looking for, say 16, apply a hashing algorithm to generate the index where the item should be found, and then go directly to that location. The size of the hash table is therefore irrelevant. Generating a hash value to determine where to find or insert an item will always have an O1 constant time complexity. Of course, remember from our previous videos that hash functions can produce duplicate hash values or indexes known as synonyms. In this case, we would need to store those items and subsequently look them up in an overflow table. These overflow tables are typically implemented as serial lists, although there are other methods. And that means we'd need to search the overflow table one item at a time. So for situations where we have to search an overflow table, we now have linear or O1 time complexity. So now let's consider linked lists. This structure is often implemented using arrays or object oriented techniques with objects and pointers. Searching through items in a linked list is exactly the same as searching an array. We start at the beginning and check each item one at a time. Therefore, the time complexity for searching a linked list is once again linear, O n. One of the advantages of a linked list is that inserting or deleting items takes no additional processing time. Items do not need to be moved around in memory to maintain the order of the items. Therefore, inserting items into and deleting items from a linked list has a constant O1 time complexity. So let's move on to binary trees. The insertion process halves the data set every time in order to find a location for the new item. Therefore, inserting items into or searching a binary tree has a logarithmic or O log n time complexity. Situations where we need to traverse an entire binary tree have a linear O n time complexity. As the size of the binary tree increases, so will the time it takes to perform a complete traversal. Both the bubble sort and insertion sort that we've previously looked at use nested loops, and this means they have a polynomial or on squared time complexity. More accurately, as they both use a single nested loop, we can refer to it as quadratic time complexity. So here's a summary of the various searching algorithms you need to be aware of for the exam. Along with their big O time complexities, taking into consideration best, average and worst case scenarios. Now, although you do also need to be aware of the best and average case time complexities, you should always be considering the worst case scenario when comparing algorithms with each other for the purpose of efficiency. Here's a summary table of the various sorting algorithms you need to be aware of for the exam. Again, along with their big O notation time complexities, 
taking into consideration best average and worst case scenarios. Now, when comparing the efficiency of one sorting algorithm against another, it's important to consider both the time and also the space complexity. Space complexity, if you remember, is the amount of memory or space the algorithm will consume during its execution. The bubble and insertion sort both have a constant O1 space complexity. Regardless of the size of the data set, they will take up exactly the same amount of memory. The merge sort has a linear O n space complexity, and the quick sort has a logarithmic O log n space complexity. So we spent the last two videos talking about big O notation, and it's important to understand exactly what the exam would want you to know about, because there's a lot to this topic, and if you're reading around in textbooks or on the internet, you might often go beyond the spec. So the OCR clarification document says you need to understand how the efficiency of an algorithm is measured using big O. Understand the meaning of constant, logarithmic, linear, polynomial and exponential complexity. Be able to recognise and draw each of these using a graph and be able to read and write their notation, for example, O brackets, N brackets. To know the best and worst case complexities for the searching and sorting methods and to understand the difference between best, average and worst case complexities and how and why these can differ for any given algorithm. So having watched this video, you should be able to answer the following key questions. What is the difference between time and space complexity? And what do we mean when we talk about an algorithm's performance in terms of best average and worst case? So before we wrap up, we want you to make you aware of our big O notation cheat sheet. So this is a double sided cheat sheet. It goes through all the big O notations you need to know about, uh, along with simple code examples, descriptions and typical uses. And on the back of the sheet is the summary tables you've seen in this video. This resource is completely free over at student.craigandave.org. Just scroll down and select the A-level revision section. And then once there, you can just press the download button to get this resource completely for free. So that's everything you need to know about Big O Notation. If you want to stick around for another 30 or 40 seconds, we're just going to touch on something slightly beyond the specification. So the exam board require you to consider the big O complexities of various algorithms in terms of their best, average and worst case scenarios. Now, this is actually a simplification. In fact, big O notation only ever describes worst case scenarios. Average case scenarios are covered by big theta, while best case scenarios are covered by big omega, and they have their own separate unique symbols. In reality, the tables you saw earlier should be represented as shown here with the correct symbols and terms. Now, it's not that the exam board wants you to learn something inaccurate. It is simply chosen to abstract the concept to aid your learning. And this kind of abstraction is very common when we teach new concepts. If you choose to study computer science beyond A-level, you'll be able to deepen your knowledge of these concepts.